Now let's turn to complex integrals, which is a wonderful theory, and it's a, again a wonderful combination of the, the algebra of complex numbers and the geometry of two-dimensional space. Um, so I want to give you the sort of the most fundamental definition, even though it's the one that doesn't often get used in practice. Um, we often kind of shortcut it, but it is going to come back in a very important way in a little bit, and that's just uh, the idea of a Riemann sum. So we've got what we what we're going to do is we got a function f of z complex valued function from from the complex plane to the complex plane and we're going to integrate it f of z dz uh, we're going to integrate it over a curve so here's uh, where we make contact with uh, like line integrals and things like that in vector calculus even if you haven't seen those though I claim that shouldn't be impossible to understand at least a little bit of what's going on um, but it's it, it would be hard so um, there's the curve it's got to be an oriented curve I've got to say which way I traverse the curve from let's say the starting point is let's say P and the ending point is Q um, and it's going to be the limit as the number of subdivisions goes to infinity roughly you have to m make sure they go in a nice way but I'm being pretty cavalier about that of the sum, well, what should it be? The sum of the values of f along the curve times dz should be the change in z. This should turn into a delta z. Okay, so it's really just exactly like Riemann sums in ordinary, like BC calculus. Let's let's review the notation, but it's really the same thing. So n is just the number of subdivisions here: one, two, three, four, five the red lines and for each K I subdivide the the curve into these straight line segments so this first one here this arrow here the difference between these two complex numbers that's Delta Z1 and then here's this arrow is Delta Z2 so remember your complex numbers you can think of as these two-dimensional vectors but really they're just differences of complex numbers that minus that okay so it's really just the algebra coming in it's not absolutely has to doesn't absolutely have to be understood algebra um, geometrically rather so here's delta z4 is delta z5 for each one of those I just pick some point along that approximating segment um, and that's going to be zk star so here's z1 star and here's z2 star etc and I evaluate the function at those points <coughs> so I, this is a complex number because that's the kind of thing that f outputs this is a complex number because it's the difference of two complex numbers and then you can sum them all up and take the limit and that limit is going to be as the subdivision gets finer you get a really good approximation to the curve and we should get an idea of adding up values of the function along the curve times little bits of motion along the curve okay so that's the Riemann sum well now in that limit though we'd like to make contact with our ordinary theory of integration okay um, and if you've looked at path integrals in, in vector calculus, this shouldn't be surprising. This should end up being the integral. Um, we should be able to, to transfer this to the real line in an ordinary integral if we parameterize this. Okay. Whenever we've got a curve, the best way to think about it is to let's take some function, and it's traditionally often called the gamma in complex analysis, from an interval a, b to the uh, to the complex plane okay so that for example gamma of a is the starting point big P and gamma of B is the ending point Q and as uh, T let's say that's traditional kind of uh, letter for this as T goes from A to B we walk along the curve here okay so what do these this turn in, turn into the limit of the sum that turns into an integral the uh, the starting point and the ending point of the curve turn into A and B and then we're just going to get F evaluated at all the points on the curve, which are all the outputs of this parameterizing function gamma, times, well, let's see, what would the delta zk turn into? Or equivalently, what would the dz turn into? Okay, well, dz should turn into just dz dt, which is how fast the, the point is moving as t changes, times dt. But if z is gamma of t, then dz dt is just gamma prime. So this is how it's often written. Okay, that's something that we don't need to remember. We're really um, in two dimensions to think about. Once we've got this parameterization, this is really just an ordinary one-variable integral. Now, it does have complex numbers as outputs. 
So this guy is going to have like u plus iv, and this is going to have an x plus iy, and we'll deal with that. But that's not hard. When you have complex numbers as outputs, you just do the real part separately and the imaginary part separately, and I'll show you how that works. Um, and it's not really that hard. Okay. So this is practically how we usually end up calculating it. Okay. But this, it, at least one place, I'm going to go back to actually this definition pretty much and show you that even using this definition, it can be pretty slick to, to help our understanding. Okay. So let's do some examples of this. I'll do some very important examples. Um, it's a big subject. Again, this is the whirlwind tour. Let's say C sub A is the circle of radius A centered at the origin. Nice, simple kind of curve. Okay. Um, and I want to take the integral over that of a power. We know that these guys, d to the k, are nice functions. Okay. Um, at least when, um, you know, when k is an integer. Okay. And so let's look at that. Well, okay, I've got to get the, my function gamma going here. Gamma of t, well, you know what? We have a function that's exactly designed to do this, that's geometrically nice, and that's algebraically and, and wonderful, and wonderful for calculus as well, analytically wonderful, okay? And that's going to be, if I take e to the i t, that's cosine t plus i sine t. That traverses the unit circle. And then I just multiply it by a to get the right radius, OK? And so t, 0 to t equals 2 pi, you're going to go exactly once around that circle. And that's just the, most, the best function ever for calculus. So this is a good, a good sign. OK, so let's see. Using the parameterizing definition, we let t go from 0 to 2 pi. z to the k is then a e to the i t to the k. And then dz, remember, is just gamma prime of t dt, because that's just, after all, dz over dt times dt. Okay. Well, what's gamma prime? Just like always, derivative of an exponential is itself, oh, but then times the chain rule factor, and that's an i, and I'll squeeze that in there. Okay. So that's times a i e to the i t dt. Uh, separate those out. Okay. So what do we get? Okay. Um, so we're going to get a to the k plus 1 in front. We're also going to get an i coming out. We might as well separate that out. 0 to 2 pi. And then these guys combine. That's the beautiful thing about the algebra of complex of uh, exponentials. I'm getting e to the k i t and e to the 1 i t. So that's e to the k plus 1 i t d t. OK. So what is that? As I said, it's just real and imaginary parts, right? cosine of k plus 1t plus i sine of k plus 1t dt. And you just do the integral of this and the integral of this separately. And just remember there's an i in front of it. And there's an i in front of the whole thing. But I'll tell you what, for most purposes, we don't have to really care what's going on with this thing. OK? Um, no, the focus looks good. I'm just going to check it. I think it's good, it's good enough. OK, this, if k is not equal to minus 1, so this is really an honest-to-god cosine function. It's really oscillating. And we'll deal with this case in a minute. That might already look familiar. Ooh, power minus 1 being special in an integral? Never heard of that before. Anyway, if k is never, not equal to minus 1, this is really like cosine t or cosine 2t or cosine 3t or cosine minus t or minus 7t. And it's going from 0 to 2 pi. So that's exactly an integral number of periods of cosine. That always dies. I could do the whole antiderivative bit, but that's not really the right way to do it. It really is to, is to observe the symmetry. Similarly, sine, integral over an exact integer number of periods of a sine function. Look at the picture. Think about the picture in your head if you want. That's 0 as well. This is just plain 0. That's a little bit surprising, OK? That this integral over this circle of any power, except perhaps minus 1, is equal to 0. It's really, really, really fundamental that that's equal to 0. If you've had vector calculus and you've seen um, things like Green's theorem, uh, that you might think, huh, does that have anything to do with that? That's something where closed curve integrals are often equal to 0. Hmm, OK. Well, let's see. What about integral of z to the minus 1 dz? Or in other words, so let's look at that case, dz over z, OK? 
What is that going to give us? Okay, same calculation. Okay, just special case. So it's a to the minus 1, e to the minus it, just putting k in equals minus 1 before, and then times a i e to the it dt. That's the dz part. Okay. Interestingly enough, the a's now cancel. The i does survive. Okay. And the e to the it's cancel. That's really crucial. I get the simplest integral ever, pretty much. I just get dt. And I get 2 pi. This is just a constant, so it's just a little rectangle when I think about it in terms of areas. 2 pi i. Very interesting. OK? Very, very interesting. In particular, it's not 0, but it's independent of the radius. So the integral over this, or over this, or over this, or over this, those are all exactly the same. Not too shocking, because this sort of is recording the fact that we the, the integral is going have to have to do with how long the circle is. It should get bigger for a bigger uh, domain of integration. And then this is getting smaller as you go out, just like this is getting bigger. So it makes sense, and that's what's going on here with the a's canceling. This says that the sort of the size of this complex number that we're integrating goes down inversely proportional to the radius, but the circumference goes up proportional to the radius, so they cancel. Okay, um, But this is a big deal that we get this, this, uh, this number, 2 pi i. Have we ever seen 2 pi i before? Hmm. Hmm. Think about uh, what I was talking about in the last video about some certain special functions. OK. So um, I think, I'm trying to think. Yeah, let's just go a little bit further with this. OK. Fundamental theorem of calculus. OK. What if I had the integral of a derivative? We've talked about complex derivatives and now and complex um, integrals, but let's combine them. Okay. Well, let's look at what this is by the uh, the way of calculating not with the Riemann sum, but with the parameterized version. Okay. Here you're going to have to take it on faith. With something I said uh, in I think the the first or, first or second video. Um, which is that the chain rule works. And look at what this is. This is the derivative of the outer with the inner unchanged times the derivative of the inner if what I'm differentiating is f of gamma of t. And indeed, OK, so now this is just a function. It's a real function. It's a, real, um, a function on just the real numbers. It happens to have complex outputs. But again, as we saw just with the cosines and sines, that didn't really scare us at all. It doesn't really complicate things. Um, so it's just the derivative of. Uh, the integral, rather, that's this guy, of a derivative. The fundamental theorem takes over. This is just f of gamma of b minus f of gamma of a. Or in other words, f of that ending point minus f of the starting point. That's cool. And again, if you're coming from a vector calculus point of view, this should really, really remind you of the fundamental theorem uh, for line integrals, um, which is really, it's really kind of a special case of it. Okay, um, But it's an, such a super important special case. OK, so in particular, oh, this might explain what we were talking about just a minute ago. OK, if uh, gamma, or let's say c, if it's a closed curve, like that circle, if p and q are the same point, then if I'm taking the integral of something that happens to be the derivative, well, yeah, it's definitely going to be 0, because it's just f of p minus f of p. OK, okay so maybe that means it's not so surprising. Because I was taking a closed curve integral of something, the integral over that circle CA of z to the k dz. Oh, yeah, certainly. OK, that's the derivative of 1 over k plus 1 z to the k plus 1. OK. And then that fundamental theorem takes over. And the fact that it's a closed curve is super important as well. And I get 0. OK, so that's one reason why that was 0. And it also shows you that for z to the k, if you had any kind of funky closed curve, even if it kind of intersected itself like that, um, then all of these guys are going to be 0, because they are just the integral of a derivative. And if the starting point and the ending point are the same, uh, it could, it's equal to 0. Notice in, in real integrals, in BC calculus, this never comes up, because the only way we ever do an integral from with the same starting point and the same ending point is just integral a to a of f of x dx. And that just seems sort of stupidly 0, because we draw the graph and we say, oh, it's the area with no width. Okay, This is much more interesting. There's a lot of cool ways to 
start at the same point, start at a point and end at the same point. Now, think about this for a second, though. Where did I just assume that k is uh, not equal to minus 1? Because this doesn't work. This shouldn't work for k equals minus 1. We did an explicit calculation for k equals minus 1, and we didn't get 0. Well, that's, of course, where this guy, that's exactly where this guy also fails. But, but wait a minute. Yeah, the formula fails, but we know an antiderivative to this, right? Shouldn't it be still be true that this is ln z? This is the derivative of the ln. Okay, and that is actually true. The derivative of the log function is z to the minus 1. You can do the calculation. It is a true fact. But wait, this seems to say that that should be 0 then because it's, you, it's the integral of a derivative. Starting point is the same as the ending point. Shouldn't it be 0? Well, that's where we have to think back to the ln function. Remember, there's something kooky about the ln function. The ln function isn't a nice function everywhere. If it starts with 0 here, do, 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 what did it have to come back to? 2 pi i. So what's going on here is the ln, this is trying to be true, it's just that when I think of this point as the start of the curve, I think of its ln as being 0. When I think of it as the end of the curve, I think of its ln as being 2 pi i. The difference of those is exactly 2 pi i, which really was the right answer for the integral of z to the minus 1 dz. So I'll just leave it there. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can say about it, but it's a cool place to stop.